this life is over oh, fly away to our home on God's celestial shore with you and intimacy with you all he's waiting for us to do is to respond so I hope and pray that that is our that is what our response will be that we will enter into the presence of God joyfully freely and not as awkward guests amen, amen. all right um, I am Chuck Butler and I am filling in for David who is out this weekend uh, and so I will be leading with y'all today join with us together as we have a word of prayer and then we're going to, I'm going to ask you to remain standing, and we're going to jump into uh, worshiping God through who, who you say I am. Father God in heaven, I just want to thank you for the privilege to be in your house this morning. Lord, I pray that you will just energize us, that you will empower us, that you will enthuse us to sing with full voices, full hearts, to greet you warmly, to greet you excitedly, because you are our God and we are your people. Father, I pray that you would just rain down your power on this room, that you will convict us, that you will convince us of our, of our needing of you. And Father, help us not to be ashamed or afraid, because though we are sinful, we are clean by your grace. And we thank you for that. And we're excited for that. Jesus, thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, amen. Say 
Hallelujah! Hallelujah! 
When my final breath is left to be lost, I'll forever be with you, Lord. Where the song goes on and on and on and on. with you, not just take orders, but to talk with you and walk with you. Father God, speak to us, share us your heart, guide us, in your precious holy name we pray, amen. Good morning, good to see everyone. We welcome those who are joining us by way of live stream today and the Gerald campus. They're joining us as well. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we're going to get there in just a little bit. So I got a text this morning at 4.59 a.m. from Brett that they're heading over to the hospital. Looks like today might be the day they have their baby, so 
pray for them and uh, appreciate Chuck filling in doing the worship today. Uh, David had a stint put in Friday, and so they told him to relax and rest. And so I told him, I don't want to see you today. But I pulled up at 6.10 this morning to get everything set up because David does all that. He spoils me. And so I just pulled up and then in pulls his car. So he came, set everything up, <laughs> and he wanted to make sure we were all taken care of. So that's just the heart that David has. So we want to pray for him as, as he recovers. He's doing really, really well. So this summer we've been doing a series on the parables, and I want to start kind of a little mini-series inside of that series, if I can, if that makes sense. We're going to be looking uh, over the next few weeks at Matthew 24 and 25, Uh, Some call that the Olivet Discourse. Uh, It was a message that Jesus gave to his disciples. And it's going to be talking about how do we wait for the second coming of the Lord. And Joe, thinking about all the times that we have to wait, let me just ask you guys and those of you who are listening by way of stream, how are you at waiting? Are you a good wait? I say a good waiter, but are you good at waiting? Are you good when you have to sit in traffic? Are you good? You know, now, it depends sometimes on what we're waiting for, right? So if, we're, uh, if I'm waiting to get my driver's license, how many of you remember you could not wait until you could get old enough to get your driver's license? But if you're in this kind of a waiting room, in a doctor's <laughs> waiting room, sometimes they call it waiting room for a reason, right? So you got, sometimes you have to wait and wait. So anyway, we're going to talk about how do we wait for the second coming of the Lord. That's what we're going to kind of begin a little mini-series, some teaching, some parables that Jesus gives on how do we wait for the second coming of the Lord. And so here on the, the Mount of Olives, we often call this, again, the Olivet Discourse or the Mount of Olives, the disciples and Jesus had just come out of the temple. And the, this, one of the disciples said to Jesus, boy, isn't the temple magnificent? And he was talking about how wonderful the temple was. And then Jesus said there was coming a day that not one stone would be on top of another. And he talked about him coming again. So they cross over the Kidron Valley over here to the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And so Jesus is going to share about his second coming and how we can prepare. And so again, this particular uh, passage is found not only in Matthew 24 and 25, but it's in Mark 13, Luke 21, and it also corresponds to Revelation 6 through 19. And so Jesus is going to talk about what's life going to be like before he comes back to earth. Now, there's two phases of his coming, in my opinion. Now, there, how many of you know there's a lot of opinions about the second coming, all right? But I'm just going to give you my opinion, and if you want to straighten me out this week and take me out and buy me lunch, I will go out and eat lunch with you, and I will listen, all right? And so anyway, I believe he's coming all the way back to earth, which I believe the signs that he gives in these chapters talk about his coming all the way to earth. But I think he's coming before that in the rapture to call the church. I don't think there are any signs that have to happen for the rapture. But there are some things that have to happen for him to come all the way down to earth. And so they're sitting on the Mount of Olives. And this is actually, if you go to Israel today and you're sitting on the Mount of Olives, you'd be looking across the Kidron Valley. And that's the Dome of the Rock. That's where the temple would have sat in Jesus' day. So this is what it would look like today. In Jesus' day, it would have looked something like this. So they're sitting on the Mount of Olives, they're looking across the Kidron Valley at the temple. And it's here that Jesus talks about his second coming. And so again, in Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, and it also corresponds to Revelation 6 through 19. So they ask him a couple questions. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of of the age. So the first part of Matthew 24, he gives some signs about his second coming. And again, that corresponds with these other chapters. And I believe there are some things that have to happen for him to come all the way to earth. 
But for him to come in the rapture again, I think he's going to come like a thief. I think he's going to come unexpected in that first part of that return. So let's look at, as he begins to teach about, how do we wait for the second coming? What does God want us to do while we're waiting for the second coming of the Lord? I'm going to have you all join me both here and if you're watching by way of live stream. Let's read together about nine verses here about how God wants us to wait for the second coming of Jesus. Join me. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so again, there's two phases to his coming. He's going to come in the rapture to call the church. I don't think any signs have to happen for that. But before he comes all the way back to earth, which Revelation 19 talks about, I think there are some things that are going to happen during the tribulation period, all right? And so if you remember, the book of Revelation ends with Jesus saying, behold, I come quickly three times. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Now, again, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, but we've been about 2,000 years now, but we should be expecting the coming of the Lord. So what does God want us to do while we're waiting. That's what the latter part of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25, it's really teaching and parables about how we are to wait for the second coming of the Lord. So number one, we're to live every day as as though it were our last day. That, That Latin term carpe diem means seize the day. I think first of all, God wants us to live every day as though this were the day that he would rapture the church. I think he wants to live every day to the very fullest. Not to bring baggage from from the past. Not to be worried about the future. I think he wants us to enjoy every single day. Because we do not know when that day will be. So that's number one. So let's look at the teaching again that he gives here. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I get kind of tickled when people give a date. And over the years, people have given a lot of dates of when the end is going to come. Now, if no one knows except the Father, I just want to go ahead and just, I, I can say with confidence, if you hear a specific date, don't worry about it. Do not sell your 401k. Do not give all your money away. If you do, let me decide what to do with it. I will humbly use it. Amen? So no one knows the day or the hour. That means no one knows. But I I kind of looking up, I got kind of interested. Back in May 21st, 2011, this was a billboard up. Judgment day is coming. Cry mightily unto God for his mercy. How many of you know May 21st? 2011 came and went. Here's the billboard that went up after that. That was awkward. No one knows the day or the hour. (laughs) Now, on the way out today, Ed Lewis, who's quite a historian, Ed Lewis tells me he knew the exact guy that made this prediction. He said, ironically, the guy that made this prediction, ironically, a couple months before this, went out and bought a couple computers and got a three-year warranty. Why? So again, no one knows the day or the hour. The part of his coming is going to come like a thief. That's why we got to live every day as though this might be the day. I mean, we got to really live every day to the fullest. Why, why rob today of worries of yesterday or thinking about tomorrow? God, first of all, wants us to wait with that anticipation that today might be that day. He goes on to say, 
For as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So he makes a comparison between his second coming and the days of Noah. Now there are some things about the days of Noah that we could not say are going to be the same as his second coming. I don't think anybody's going to build an ark for his second coming. I don't think he's saying the world's going to be altogether wicked except one family. Now there's probably going to be some wickedness, but not worldwide. But what he's saying is, as he's making the comparison, if you just look at the text, he's saying that as in the days of Noah, they were going to go in about their everyday normal routine. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They were eating and drinking. How many of you eat and drink every day? All right. And so they were just going through their normal routine. And so what Jesus is saying, when he comes back, it's going to be a normal everyday routine. Like every other day, people, and I looked in the paper this week, there's still marriage announcements. There's still funeral announcements or funeral things in the paper. Three pages of, of funeral things today in the, in the Sunday paper. There's all kinds of things in the paper. You know, I, I want to tell you, can you imagine preparing for a wedding? How many of you have ever done the pre preparation part of a wedding? It takes months, months, if not years. Most of the time, I'm just saying most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, it's the bride and her mom. Most grooms that I work with, just whatever she says, I'm just going to go where I'm supposed to go, be where I'm supposed to be, and do what I'm told. I said, you're going to make it in marriage right there, man. You're going to do it. <laughs> but, you know, they're going to be married. There's going to be marriages. There's going to be things going on every single day that are going to be very, very normal. That's why I believe he could come at any day. First of all, we're to live and we're to wait for his coming as though this were the last day of him before he comes back. So in the days of Noah, again, as the Bible says, they were marrying, they were given in marriage, they were eating, they were drinking, and they did not know, even though Noah undoubtedly preached to them. And it's amazing how many sermons I've heard on the second coming, how many people, I, I can't tell you how many pastors that I respect who have said back in the day, I believe the second coming is coming in my lifetime. I think I'm going to be alive when the second coming is here. And many of those have died. But you know, I think that's how we're supposed to live. I honestly think we're supposed to live as though we're going to be alive when he comes. I think we're to live every day as though this were our last day. How would that change how we view every day if we honestly really live life to the fullest Every single day. And I think that's what he's teaching. But back in the day of Noah, they did not know until the flood came. When the door of the ark shut, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, judgment came. And the Bible says they were all carried away. And so the second coming of Christ, in the same way, at least the first part of his coming, I don't think there has to be any signs take place for the rapture. Now, if we are seeing some signs, which I think we are seeing some signs, that would mean the rapture is even that much closer. But I'm, I'm like all other pastors, all other people before, I believe I'm going to be alive when he comes back. But if I, I'm going to eject out of this earth suit and I'm going to be with him on the other side. But in the days of Noah, again, they were just going through their everyday normal routine and they were not thinking about the second coming or, or the flood. And then he talks about separation. This to me is kind of hard to really, when you think about, when judgment comes, when he comes back, the Bible says two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Now in order to really understand this passage, you've got to put your mind in a Jewish culture. In a Jewish culture, if two men are out in the field working, most likely it's a father and a son or two brothers. I mean, they would farm as a family. And so when two people are out in the field, it's again going to be a father and a son out working, our two brothers. And one is going to be taken and one's going to be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Again, in Jewish culture, this most likely would be a mother and a daughter who were grinding at the mill, our two sisters. In both cases, I feel pretty confident 
This is families that he's talking about. These two men, these two women. And by the way, Luke's gospel adds this. Two will be in one bed, one will be taken, and the other left. His coming is going to be so sudden that some family is going to be taken, others is going to be left. That's why we got to live every day as though this were the day. We can't wait till tomorrow. I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to over the years and say, well, I may give my life to the Lord. I may get right with God, but I want to wait till I get through this time and this season in my life. Why would you? Why in the world would you walk out of these doors without knowing that you know that you know Jesus? I mean, if today could be the day, who in the world would want their family broken up? I think we would want to live every day as though this were the last day. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Yeah, we got to live every day. Just live in anticipation as though this might be the day. By the way, next week, we're planning on looking at the parable of the ten virgins. In that parable, his delay is, his coming is delayed. So that teaches us what do we do when his, his coming is delayed. But this teaching is on being ready at any moment of any day, all right? And so the story he gives, three things here, two women grinding at the mill, Two men out in the field. And then Luke's gospel adds two people in one bed. Again, they would probably be family. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, one of them is gone. Can you imagine? I mean, to me, it breaks my heart to think if there's ever anybody that you're connected to on this journey, it's people in your family. You know, I've had the privilege, and I call it a privilege, over the last eight or ten weeks to probably average two funerals a week. Had one yesterday. Many of them were people that did not have a church home. But as I, as I meet with a family, just love on them, what an opportunity to remind everybody to be ready, to make sure we have a relationship with God, because we never know. We actually never know when we might be called to the other side or Christ might come back at any moment. But how sad to think that families will be forever separated because they were not prepared on a daily basis. That, to me, is so sad to think. You know, and over and over in the Bible, the Bible talks about separation. The parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. Jesus says they're going to grow together side by side until the end. The angels will come and separate the wheat from the tares. But they're going to literally live side by side until the final judgment. And then he goes on to give the parable of the great net that was cast out into the sea, which gathered all kinds of fish. And Jesus says that when they gather all these fish in, the angels are going to come and separate the good from the bad. The same fish living in the same body of water are going to literally be separated for eternity. I believe that's why the second coming of Christ is so important. Might he delay? He might delay. He has delayed for 2,000 years. But if we really, if we truly would live every day as though this were the day, not one person would walk out of here today without knowing that they know that they know that they know Jesus. I can't imagine anybody walking out gambling on the fact that he is going to delay his coming. And that's what he's teaching. Be ready. First of all, we need to be ready for his coming. And next week, we're going to look at the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. Five were ready, five weren't. And so we're going to look at that next week. So if he does delay, what does God want us to do while he is delaying? And then the sheep and the goats, we're going to end with the last part of Matthew 25, when he comes back and separates the nations, the sheep from the goats. And again, I just want to say over and over and over in the Bible, it talks about separation. I mean, that to me would just grab my heart. And when I, when I do these funerals and I see the heartache of these families who have lost a loved one, especially if it's unexpected, and to visit with these families and try to encourage them to think in the twinkling of an eye when Christ would come back in the rapture, that families would be separated not only on this earth, but throughout all eternity. Can you imagine? To never, ever be able to see a loved one again, even on the other side. So he says here, but know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. 
Therefore also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. How many of you have ever had your house broken into? Anybody? All right. I, my, I can remember back when I was a child growing up, our house was broken into several times. And when they came in, when you come home and know that your house has been broken into, it's an eerie feeling. First of all, you don't know if they're still in there, but just the fact they've gone through everything. And, and true story, they came in our house, and we, have a three, we had a three-bedroom house. They took every drawer out, dumped it on the floor. They threw the mattresses up. I mean, they just ransacked the closets. True story, when they came in my bedroom, apparently they looked in and they did not touch my bedroom. It looked like somebody already got it, I guess. I don't know. They didn't mess with my bedroom. So we found out if we're going to hide our valuables, we, do it in, we hide them in my bedroom. They didn't even go in my bedroom. But they go through the house, but it's such an eerie feeling. But let me say this. If, I, if we knew the thief was coming, I would have been there with a couple of my football friends to share Jesus. Amen. I'd have the police there. If I knew they were coming, but they always came when we weren't expecting them. And Jesus is saying, that's how the coming's going to be. That's why, yeah, there are some signs that have to happen before he comes to earth. That's true. But for the rapture, I don't believe any sign has to happen. I think the rapture could happen, and then all the signs take place before he comes back to earth. It could be that way. So again, if you say, well, I'm not that worried because everything hasn't happened that he says has to happen, I'm just telling you, he's going to come like a thief when people do not expect him. That's why he begins in teaching, how do we wait for the second coming of Christ? We wait by living every day as though this were the day. If you really believe that, man, you'd want to obviously be right with your family. You would want to try to smile along the way, throw out some love of Jesus along the way. Here's what I want us to do. I debated whether or not to do this. What's it going to be like when families are separated? Here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you to do. You don't have to do it. I'm just asking you. I want everyone here that's sitting with a family member I don't want you to talk to your family for just a minute. But the family member that's closest to the center aisle or closest to Joe up there in the back, if you're up in the balcony, the one that's closest, I want you right now, without looking at your spouse or looking at your family, I just want you to stand up and walk to the back. If you're up in the balcony, just stand up and walk behind the sound booth. The ones who are closest to the sound booth. And try to social distance, all right? I don't want to try to make sure I don't get anybody in trouble. All right, just kind of stay kind of loose back there. If today was the day and families were separated... I wonder for those of you that are in the back and those of you that are still seated, would you be okay that you've said everything you needed to say to your loved one if it happened that fast? And by the way, when I used to read and teach this this particular passage, I always saw those who were taken as the believers, and I still kind of lean that way. But if I'm being honest in the text, in the days of Noah, those that were taken away were taken away in judgment. So it's possible that you sit, sitting here might be the Christians. Unlikely, but it's possible. But what would it feel like if you honestly would never, ever see your loved one again throughout all eternity? That's what it's going to be like. I can't really wrap my mind around being forever separated from family. And that's why he's teaching, man, we got to live every day. We can't waste a day. We got to live every day as though this were the day. You guys can come back in. If somebody left to get something to drink, God bless you. One day he's going to come back. Two, two, uh, Brothers or father and son will be out in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. 
A mother and daughter will be grinding at the mill, or two sisters, one will be taken and one will be left. I hope that you're ready. I don't want anybody to ever stand before God and say, I wasn't sure about how to be ready. I think at every funeral service I have the privilege to do, I always say, even though the person may or may not have went to church, I said, I know if they could come back, they would want to remind you about heaven. And they would want to remind you it's not about a church, it's not about a denomination, but it is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful when I was 13 years old, I was in a church service I didn't want to be in, but God got a hold of my heart. And even though I was a member of the church, I joined the church when I was eight years old because I knew everything I was supposed to say. But when I was 13 years old, I just had a tug in my heart and I just knew that I knew that I knew that I needed Jesus. I can't tell you how hard it was as a 13-year-old boy to get up and come forward in the church I belonged to. My dad was a deacon, but I knew that I needed to come and just give my life to Jesus. And, I'm, I, I, and I can still remember to this day, I'm 63 years old now, been 50 years, it was like a weight lifted off of my shoulders. I hope and I pray that nobody walks out of here today without Jesus. You say, what's the difference between those that make it and those that don't? This is my last slide. You know, I believe as we look at Calvary and the three crosses of Calvary, and by the way, all four Gospels point out the fact there were three crosses, and I believe they all four point out that Jesus' cross was in the middle of the other two. Why would all four Gospels point that out? I think as we look at Calvary, we see a picture of the difference of those who make it and those who do not. Because on both sides of Jesus, on either side, there was a thief. All we know about these guys is they were thieves. And maybe they, they did crime together. Maybe they did evil together all of their life. And they were going to die together. But the difference was the cross in the middle. And the one thief looked over and somehow only God could have stirred his heart to realize that guy dying next to him was dying for himself, for his sin. And remember he said, the thief said to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How did he know that? He probably hadn't been to Sunday school. He hadn't sat through one of my services. How would he know that? The Holy Spirit, he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus, in all the agony of Calvary, looked over and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Man, these two thieves that maybe were evil all of their life are going to be forever separated in eternity. And it's not because the one thief did anything good. He didn't deserve heaven. By the way, he not only had not done anything good, he wasn't going to get to do anything good. He was dying that day. He came to heaven simply by the grace of God, by trusting in Christ. The other thief, who as far as we know, went to hell. He didn't go to hell because he was bad. I want to tell you, you don't go to heaven because you're good. You don't go to hell because you're bad. It's all about whether or not we trust that cross in the middle. Do we believe that Jesus died for us? I want to pray just a simple prayer. And, you know, in salvation in the Bible, the last verse, salvation is always in the present tense. You, ever, you know that in the Bible? I love how Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 6, Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Why is that? Because we don't know if we have tomorrow. I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, I, I'm planning on getting saved, but it's going to be later on. That's why Jesus is teaching, man, live for today. Do not walk out without Jesus. Man, take every day and live it to the fullest as though Jesus might come back today. That's how we begin to wait for the second coming of Jesus. I want you all to stand, and if you're at the Gerald campus, if you'll stand. I want, I want to just say a prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody to repeat it after me, all right? Now, probably most of you, maybe all of you have already prayed this prayer but maybe there's one person here today that for the first time in your life, you want to know when you walk out of these doors that you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And it's not because you deserve heaven. 
but it's because of the grace of God. And God loved you, and Jesus loved you so much that he would have rather died on the cross than to have heaven without you. Wow. So would you all, I just want everybody to say this prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I do not deserve heaven. I ask you to forgive me. I open up the door of my heart. I invite you into my life as Lord and Savior. From this day forward, my life belongs to you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. I had a gentleman at the 8 o'clock service that went out, and all he said to me was, I prayed that prayer. So as we're going to do kind of a mini-series on how do we wait for the second coming of the Lord, it begins by just living every day as though this might be our last day. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to close with a song. Love you guys. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray for my church family. I just pray for everyone that's in this room. And God, my heart is that not one person would walk out of this room or out of the Gerald campus without knowing that they know you. Father, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Give us the grace and the wisdom to take one day at a time and to really live every day to the absolute fullest, believing that today could be the day that you come back. Father, may we all be there on the other side at that great reunion because we've trusted Christ as our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.